our next question is from Daniel Shea, um, probably for Gang, but he'll, uh, based on the timing, but he'll, he'll clarify. And then after that, Gang, it, it looked like you, you wanted to say something. So um, after you'd be next after that. Uh, and then we have a question in the chat from Andrew Tatarski. So uh, uh, Daniel. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you very much, David. Um, my name is Daniel Shea from A Touch of Light out of Seattle uh, in Washington State. We've been working with incarcerated artists uh, locally, nationally, and internationally for the last few years, which is why you really sort of caught my attention, gang. Um, less of a question necessarily. More just like, hey, we would really love to connect with you. It sounds like you are doing some fantastic and amazing work. Um, hello to Charlie as well. Uh, since we've uh, we've done a bit of work with Mr. Sullivan and Cure over the last couple of years as well, um, that's basically all I had. So hope we can connect. And uh, Mr. Borden, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to sit in and listen to all the rest of you folks. Ruben, um, the discussion that you had as far as the Philippines and not only the drug war but how that is being dealt with, um, we're we're interested in you know conversing further on that. So thank you very much. Sure, Daniel. Well, I'll, I'll find you on the internet. That's easy. Um, what I wanted to say was I, to backtrack a little bit, there, there, we had this dangerous drug, Comprehensive Dangerous Drugs Act. Isn't that right, Ruben, in 2002? And that's really when the congestion started. What happened was some of the articles, um, it, all of a sudden there was a measurement of what the grams of possession of uh, what, whichever drug, you know, whether it's ecstasy, MDMA, uh, um, marijuana, which for us is still illegal, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. I think they reduced the amount of grams to make it non-bailable, right? So let's say, let's just say from a kilo to 10 grams, uh, that's not the act num actual number. And so what happened was, um, jail started to get congested. And this is exactly why I, I was assigned to do a documentary on why jails are congested, because that was the problem. And that at that time, the Chief Justice was Renato Puno. And one of, one, of, um, the, well, one of the first things I had to do was go around the country and actually visit detention centers. So we visited my te our team uh, of four filmmakers and... We're actually four friends, and then we guess I didn't want to do the documentary alone. It was going to be too emotionally taxing, and also um, I felt safer to work with three other male uh, filmmakers, to be very blunt. So we went around, and we actually visited 51 institutions. Um, 38 would be detention centers, and the rest are actually provincial. And the thing I noticed is in detention centers, when they're newly arrested, um, the energy, the, the feeling inside is just a lot more tense than when they're already convicted. Uh, there's a reason. Because either many of them are withdrawing from the drug, whatever, with, with nothing there. They're not sure. They have no representation and etc. So part of our thesis was supposed to do, a, part of our research was supposed to be what causes congestion and how do we address it and naturally um, a lot of businessmen would propose uh, building larger prisons having it uh, privatized making it outsourced change the location because the present maximum security is in actual um, gentrified a gentrified area and the and the lot is at the real estate is really jumping up so uh, one of the things that I focused on, I fo my documentary was the most boring. I focused on the, the lack of public attorneys. So <laughs> it was really the most boring. The, the three others were, were very graphic. They, they studied the, the gang system. <laughs> it's so funny. I named gang and I teach in prison. How's that for fate? So uh, they, they learned the gang system, how it actually helps out with discipline and safety inside. And another one studied the food. Another one studied, um, uh, what, what's the word, the org chart, the organizational chart of the mayor and, and who's in charge. I did the, 
public attorneys. Do you know that at that year, I don't know what the numbers are like now. I don't imagine it's tremendously better. But when I did my documentary, my working title was 1046-2261. You know what that is? 1,046 public attorneys in the entire Philippines. That's 7,107 islands. Okay? And 2,261 courts. Okay? 25% of which, or 23%, don't have judges. And I was like, how do we... So there are judges rotating and there are people charged with nothing, with no days in court because judges in a conference and judges in the other uh, court. Um, and, and not only that, I've met real people, real inmates, four years, no arraignment. He doesn't even know what he's charged of, charged with. Of. No lawyer. He's not sure. And then there's one, 17 years. He served 17 years. Every six months, he goes to, to, to a court and judge is not there. So he has to go back. And since it's a round robin and there's no judge in another court, he has to go back. And then he found out, finally, he's convicted of the crime and his sentence was only four years because he only stole wire from our electric company, Meralco Manila Electric Company. And so the, the state kind of owes him 13 years. So I was say, we always have this running joke, like, why don't you go ahead and, and, and steal furniture because you already served time for it. But that's just a joke. But the next is, I think the reason why I'm sharing this is because the reason why a lot of our courts are empty, meaning there are no judges, is because very few want to be appointed. Because look at, uh, just recently, is that right, Ruben? We've had, what, three or four deaths of regional trial court judges. Uh, investigations go nowhere, brick walls, etc. And a lot of the judges um, are not safe physically. So that nobody really says yes. And if they are, they tend to play safe and etc. I'm not saying everyone. Certainly, there are very well very brave and very courageous judges around. And normally, they're the ones who are very franchised. So they're either from a wealthy family, a very powerful family themselves, uh, themselves, um, but certainly not the career judge. And I'm just so stunned to find out that Ruben actually went to law school with Duterte because um, I always wondered about that. So I, th I guess I wanted to share. I wanted to share that backtrack. That's why the drug war is connected. Even the drug war is connected to the congestion. And of course, it doesn't even count the street uh, killings in the street. And and that to this day there is not one big drug lord uh, in jail, except except they said allegedly Senator Lila De Lima, who is is in jail, can't bail for a drug charge when he, they never found any judge in her person, in her domicile, in her it, nothing. But she's still in jail and it's been three some years. So that's what's happening here. I'm sure you know that. I think I just wanted to say it because I just wanted other people to listen and maybe you can do something where you are. Maybe there's a human face to it because it's real. And Senator DeLima, in fact, was subjected to a... Um largely incommunicado situation for... Um, Over the pandemic, yes. Yeah, uh, partially lifted, um, uh, but uh, the, uh, they took the opportunity to bar her from speaking with anyone except for uh, the staff at the uh, Camp Crame uh, Detention Center. And yes. recently that um, she's been able to have contact with family. I I also, need, I also need to synthesize this for those who are not quite familiar. Senator De Lima was imprisoned, uh, charged without bail, in the first six months of her term as a senator, in the first six months of his term as president. Can you imagine how that made our legislators feel? And now you know why our legislators always swing his way? Because in the first six months, he did a demo. This is what I can do. You know, non-bailable drug charge. Um, it's insane. But here we are. Here we are. <laughs> yes. So um, we had a question from Andrew Tatarski. Shall I read the, your comment, Andrew, or did you want to uh, join? Um, I, I did read it, David, so I can directly answer it. Yeah, that would be great. Um, I mean, the, you know, the main point that I am concerned about, I'm a, tr I'm a treatment person. I've been in the field for many years, and I've been very concerned that most treatment globally 
is inadequate at best and uh, frequently damaging uh, at most. And that's particularly so in, um, you know, and I kind of see the inadequacy of treatment as being a byproduct of prohibition and the drug war. And so uh, I, I think that, it, that, that the inadequacies and the damage done by, in the name of helping often is given short shrift in the uh, drug policy world and that that really needs to be one of the pillars of drug policy reform. Um, you know, particularly when there's mandatory treatment like in the Philippines, but even in the United States, we call treatment um, uh, voluntary, but you know, under prohibition, when people are given the option of treatment, it's sort of like mandatory treatment. Um, and I think that, that mandatory and adequate treatment is often you know, just as traumatic as prison and that that is a major issue that we need to address as a, as a global community. So I'm curious about your thoughts about how we might take that on. I, I'm sure our colleagues from the UN have larger policy answers. So I, I'll just make two points. Uh, reparations for, for instance, torture victims includes rehabilitation programs. And that's been one of the pillars of reparations design that uh, people like me and others have worked on. Uh, there are even programs in Chile, for example, a separate healthcare system was established just for victims of the Pinochet dictatorship and their healthcare needs. So you, you, you have reparations that can directly address the health impact of torture, of other physical integrity violations. And I don't see why rehabilitation as a form of reparation shouldn't apply to victims of the drug war or victims of enforced and cruel and unusual punishment that might include you know, detention in effect or um, unjust terms of rehabilitation. Uh, one important point to consider, particularly in the Philippines, but even elsewhere, is also the class differentiation in terms of rehabilitation. There's access for privileged and luxurious rehabilitation in the United States, in the Philippines, elsewhere, but public rehabilitation is something as, as, as cruel as punishment itself. So that's one. The other aspect perhaps that, that's important to consider here is that um, these are social rights. These are protected as much as civil rights, as much as political rights. And there is in fact a mechanism in the UN Convention on Economic and Social Rights that now allows for complaints to be filed before a committee that enforces that convention. Um, it's in effect, many countries are still not parties to it, but I hope that our colleagues in the UN can take on the, the role of convincing countries that in their drug policy, access to rehabilitation that is humane should be considered a social right, and violation of that social right should be subject to a complaint mechanism in this convention, but because our focus is often on violence in terms of physical integrity, killing and arrest, it's often neglected. And so I think it, it's something that ought to be considered. Thank you. I think it's hard to ignore even the mental health aspect because as a teacher, I can say almost everyone, every single inmate I've encountered has an unprocessed childhood trauma. I can easily say at least 98%. Um, which makes it which makes it preventable apparently. Which makes crime a preventable thing it turns out. And, and, and I think we need to start that now like with this next generation. I was going to say next generation of criminals but it doesn't sound right. But with the next generation, we're going to have to start it from there. And so we can't help but have multi and cross-disciplinary approaches to these uh, issues and to these um, challenges. We really can't deal with it as mere rehab uh, in the biophysiological uh, sense because there is always the other aspect really, which is you know, parenting, community, uh, et cetera. I, 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 I was going to say, I shit you not. Is that okay to say? I kid you not. Every single inmate I encountered will have one story of an unprocessed trauma, whether it's um, excessive neglect, sexual abuse, um, physical abuse, or emotional abuse, or verbal, or all, 
or everything. And these are just reactions, and some are really just um, disorders caused by trauma that festered and became large, and then it became a, a, a life of crime, you know. And, and then I asked them, "There's one, one last, a, a last story. I met an inmate who was already set free. He he did his 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 time, and he applied as um uh, as a cook in the in the kitchen of the prison. And I said." Don't you want to leave? Don't you want to go home? And he said, you know, all my life I've been in the street. When I was incarcerated, it's the first time I had a schedule. I knew what to do at 9 a.m. I knew they counted us at 12. And I knew at 5 o'clock they'll close the gates. I felt kind of safe that night. At night. And in the morning, I knew exactly what to do again. And there was certainly a meal. And for the first time in my life, I felt there was order. And so I don't want to leave. Outside is too scary for me. That's not even institutionalized in the way we understand it. This is someone who found a parent. Can you imagine? So uh, I really think all, many, many, many multidimensional sectors should really cooperate in this, uh, from police, law enforcement to, to uh, drug rehabilitation to reparation, what Ruben's expertise, everybody else's expertise. And then now we have COVID. You know, it's really so, but we have our work cut out for us, I suppose. This is why. I'm I'm very grateful. I'm part of I part I was part of this tonight or early morning because I would like to uh, see if there's other things we can some of us can work on together. Like Ruben, I'm so curious about learning more from you, um, Dr. Sala as well, Naina, of course, Charlie and and David. Thanks for coordinating this, and Andrew also. I need to learn more about the treatment aspect. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You give me hope. Ruben's informing he has to sign up for a meeting. Thank you for uh, for joining us. Thanks so long over time. For um, for our speakers who remain, um, uh, I wish I thought of uh, asking this uh, before, but um, uh, you probably know the expression uh, elevator pitch. Uh, if uh, and then we're trying not to ride elevators with us right now because of the pandemic, but if um, if one uh, had the opportunity to do an elevator pitch to uh, a, uh, a legislator <clears throat> or a governmental leader, um, what are your most important asks uh, we should give for um, what to do right now? Uh, what 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 the UN and its member states should do right now? Uh, to give uh, give their best for the areas of the sustainable development goals that uh, you are most focused on. Uh, Eha. Um. Thank you very much. Um, if I, can I say something? And uh, I had to raise my hand manually because I couldn't find this button for raise hand. Thing. Um, earlier, after my presentation, there was a question, and I promised to get back to you on it, which is related to the prevalence of HIV in the in prisons in, in the U.S. So uh, I managed to get the data, and let me start with uh, saying that HIV or the epidemiological situation of HIV in prison is reflecting the community, and this, this is clear that in countries where uh, there is a generalized epidemic of HIV in the community, you will see higher prevalence in prisons as well. And a good example is Eastern and Southern African countries where you can see um, the prevalence of prison can reach up to 15% uh, against the, um, the global pr prison prevalence, which is 4.6%, as I mentioned. The data I'm talking about right now, and that's a, there's a study that has been published in The Lancet. It's available online. And the name of the study of the title is the Global Burden of HIV TB in Prison Settings, which has been released in the, in, in the Lancet in 2016, and it's indicating that the HIV prevalence in North America is um, um, below uh, 2%. This means that it's lower than uh, the global average, uh, while HCV is close to 15%, which is very close to the global average of HCV prevalence in prison. And, <clears throat> which is 15.1%, as I mentioned earlier in my, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Any, um, any thought, any, um, 
additional contributions from our speakers, be it an uh, elevator pitch or uh, otherwise? Yeah, uh, thanks, David, if you'll allow me. It's just that uh, COVID-19 uh, is a colliding with ongoing HIV epidemics and, uh, and, and this crisis wake up call to do things differently. Uh, and we need to, to um, always remember to keep communities and people in the center of everything we do and, uh, and, and have a public health and a human rights approach to the work that we do. And that is what uh, UNITS is committed to doing uh, and will continue to do with uh, all our interactions with uh, all our stakeholders. Thank you. Is there any, uh, any? Well, I want to thank Andrew for the comment because I think the, the sentences or the phrases I was, I was looking for earlier was to shift the understanding or the view of drug use and etc. from a terribly harsh glare of criminal light in the criminal light and shift it, not shift, just, um, that's a byproduct of it, but it's really a cross-disciplinary dis, cross thing. There has to be other approaches to it really and bio, biopsychosocial, most definitely, most definitely. It's not as simple as, oh, you're using drugs, we'll lock you up. But you should separate you from the, from the people you can harm, from the collective you can harm. Now stay here. No, and that's usually how we solve it. It's really, but actually if you dig through it and if, you, if you've even barely read a sentence from Gabor Mate, you know that addiction and, and everything is really a response to, to try to soothe certain things and addiction is actually not the problem but an attempt at a solution to escape larger deeper sharper pains that are never processed you know uh, and i'm talking about the larger majority of drug users uh, there are some that are really might be on a different range to be generis altogether but majority has to be approached on a biopsychosocial manner really, and not neglecting the mental health aspect of it. I've seen it, I've seen it, 98% easily. I can go 100, I can bet. I can, okay, a dollar. <laughs> no, okay, 10, $10. I can bet $10, 100%. Unprocessed trauma, somewhere, somewhere. And then they end up there. We can't just change our practice, yeah. Yeah, but at least we must try. Or at least incorporate. We can't change the police part of it, especially in my macho government. We really can't change the police SWAT part of it. There, it that, that's, that's there. And perhaps it's necessary. But there should be other strains to the braid. You know, there has to be other approaches. They should be thrown to uh, more appropriate places. Well, I, 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 this, is my, this is Michelangelo from Delaware. I think un, unprocessed trauma is something to think about. I, love, uh, I don't, uh, that term is very deep, unprocessed trauma. I kind of, I know what you're saying. It's very, very deep. Thank you for bringing that up. Most welcome. Please think about it and then do something where you are. And if you can help us over here too, that would be awesome. Any, um, any more questions or comments? Well, yeah, David, I just want to emphasize what I said in my um, note that um, I think that generally, you know, there tends to be a focus on shifting our practices, but that if the, the dominant practices are based on wrong ideas about how to understand problematic drug use or drug use in general, that are based on these old ideas of drug use as immoral, which then sets the stage for criminal, which then sets the stage for punishment and, and stigma, that we really need to focus on, on changing the narratives and, and kind of helping people uh, adopt a whole new way of thinking about these issues, which then is kind of a, it, it offers a different lens through which to understand why people engage in problematic use that then will support the shift in policy and treatment that we're all you know, working toward. Thank you, Andrew. I didn't, I'm learning so much from everyone. Yeah. It's worth staying up. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad uh, 
Glad that you feel that way. I've, I've certainly uh, gotten a lot from this as well. And I, I want to express my appreciation to all the speakers and uh, to all of our attendees, but especially uh, those of you who stuck it out through uh, what turned out to be uh, uh, more than a uh, uh, two-hour forum. Um, one of the silver linings of the current situation is that uh, we uh, have not uh, caused another um, NGO uh, in the same room to be uh, have less time for their own uh, uh, set up of preparations uh, for their events. Uh, so um, uh, the um, uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, for those of you not already familiar, are are worth um, are, are, are worth reading up on and getting involved in. Um, my um, my new uh, phone actually came with a uh, development goals app uh, pre-installed, uh, and so uh, they have a wide following. Um, I'm not remembering the exact URL, but you Google sustainable development goals, you'll get websites from the UN, the UN Foundation, and lots of other information. Uh, our own work uh, uh, on international programs, uh, you can read about at um, stopthedrogwar.org slash global and uh, stopthedrogwar.org slash Philippines. And uh, we are involved in, in domestic policy as well. Uh, if you're not already a subscriber to our newsletter, Hope you'll visit our website and sign up or send me an email. I'll be glad to sign you up. And uh, I'll leave the chat on for a couple more minutes uh, in case anyone wants to uh, scroll through the group chat, uh, see uh, some of the interesting comments uh, on it and resources uh, people have uh, linked. Uh, but at this point, uh, I'd say we are adjourned and so, um, uh, thank you all uh, once again, and uh, good luck to everyone uh, where uh, wherever you are.